This is a geek leader. Hey guys, John Rada back again with episode 80 of a Geek Leader podcast. And it is Thanksgiving week here in the United States, and I want to spend a couple minutes just telling people what I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for my wife, Valerie, and my three kids, Elliot, Christian, and Savannah. I'm thankful for this podcast and these listeners that we've had. We've had listeners in 70 countries and in all the states in the United States, which is pretty awesome. Um, I am thankful for uh, my family. I'm thankful for my job. I'm thankful for the weather we've had outside, and just the list can go on and on and on. And I think gratitude is really important to um, remember the things that are are going well and to think about those things on a regular basis. I'm also thankful for our servicemen who who uh, sacrificed to defend our, our way of life here in the United States. And I've had had a Navy SEAL on the last episode, and I have another one on this episode. And today we have Tom Shea. And Tom Shea was the author of Unbreakable, A Navy SEAL's Way of Life, which is an awesome book. It was really intense. Um, but he wrote this to his kids kind of to tell what his way of life is like and some of the things that he's going through. And uh, he, he, today in, in, in the uh, podcast, we talk about the five pyramids of success that, that Tom mentions. He's also a consultant now, and he consults C-level executives on leadership and um, and that kind of thing. Tom also has ran ultra marathons and adventure races and all kinds of th- stuff like that. And one of the things that I found out during um, my research into Tom is that he lives about 30 minutes away from um, my mom and sister, which is pretty cool, um, right down in South Carolina. So we had a really awesome conversation about the 13 life lessons uh, in the Unbreakable series. We talked about um, keys to leading and being humble. It was just an incredible interview. So check it out and give it up for Tom Shea. Thanks for having having me on. So, um, how did you get involved? How did you how did you get to the Navy, and how did you why, why did you decide to become a Navy SEAL? Well, I grew up at a time. So I'm 50 now, and I grew up at a time where I think uh, the United States was at its utmost. And I, here's why I say that: uh, I had the freedom to do anything I wanted to do, and I was lived in a small community in Southeast Indiana. In my backyard was a river and hunting, and and my parents were gracious enough to say, you can do whatever you want to do. You just got to go do it, and if you need money, you got to earn money. And uh, so I, I grew up with the mindset that as long as I'm willing to put in the effort and time, I could do anything I wanted to do. And uh, I grew up outside, and uh, the the only way to make a living being an outdoor, you know, man or woman in any case, uh, took me to, uh, I wanted to figure out how to live in that environment. And the only thing I could figure out how to do was be a seal. And, uh, so I, I signed up for seal training and uh, that's how the path begun, began, you know, from living an outside. Hmm. So I've heard so many stories from many different people about going through SEAL training, going through BUDS, and how difficult that is. Um, how did that prepare you for what you would see later on in your career as a Navy SEAL? It's the greatest training in the world. I think everybody should go through something that demonstratively hard in their life because it prepares you for everything that comes after I signed up for SEAL training and I couldn't swim. I just wanted to go. And then I learned how to swim by practice and practice and relentless hours in the pool. And then I get to SEAL training. SEAL training is still the the basic training called BUDS, Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL, is six months long. And it still has an 85% fail out rate. It's not really fail out. You quit. So the quit rate is so high. And I think everybody should experience that in life where you're given a task that you cannot do and you got to figure out how to do it or you quit or you get injured. And, uh, and the, there's three phases in training. I say it because it makes sense after I say it. Uh, the first phase is about, we're going to give you every physical problem, and it just stacks up and it gets harder and harder and harder. And then it culminates in first phase with a week of training called hell week. And it's that it's, it's hell. 
it starts out at on Sunday night and it goes until Friday afternoon and you get pushed mentally and physically well past what you thought you could do. And, and it's the beat down, the physical and mental beat down. And the only way out is to make it to the end on Friday or you quit and everybody quits. So many people quit because there's good reasons to quit. I'm freezing. I can't stand up. I'm sick. I'm puking. My legs hurt. I broke a toe, whatever the reason is. If you decide to have a reason driven life, you will quit. If you decide that that doesn't matter, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do and make it to the end, you make it. And that aspect of life is what you can take into the rest of your, of your life. And that's honor your word. You said you were going to do it, find a way to do it. And that's what I've taken from that training into the business world is teaching people the value of that honoring your word experience. Hmm. And I've never said it that way. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, you said it very well. Um, so going Go through something like that, I, I agree with you hundred percent. And I always try to tell my kids that they need to get comfortable being uncomfortable and that the only way to grow and to get better and to achieve more Ooh, is I to lost be comfortable. You there, sorry. Oh, I was just saying, uh, I think it's important. And I tell my kids this all the time that they need to learn to be or, or become uncomfortable or comfortable being uncomfortable. So it's important to be comfortable while you're uncomfortable. Yeah, because think about the here's the reality. There's going to be 90 percent of what you do is either you've never done it before or it's hard to do or or it's uncomfortable. And I'm a I'm a firm believer in the, the realization that you got to be OK with that aspect of life is that things are difficult. Don't shy away from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, so in your book, Unbreakable, you, you, you kind of started out talking like it was a, uh, a letter to your kids. And you wanted to, and I guess the whole book is really like, a, like that, to tell them more about your life and your experiences. And the book gets pretty intense with some, uh, some, some battles that you go through. And one of the things that you kind of leaned, it seemed like you leaned on in the book was the experience of adventure racing. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how something like that set you up um, and prepared you for some of the, the, the things that you would go through in combat? I started doing adventure racing when I was a, a SEAL instructor. And I'd already spent some time at SEAL Team 2 on the East Coast, and then I check into SEAL training on the West Coast. And and I, I, I tend to get bored quickly. So even though being an instructor was intense, I wanted to challenge myself to lead people through very difficult experiences and uh, adventure racing is multi-sport they give you a map and a compass and uh, you have three other members on your team and there's a start and an end point and whoever gets to the end the quickest wins and there are six seven hundred mile races you got to navigate sleep eat all on your own you got to work out problems and that was seemed to be the greatest way to prepare myself to lead SEALs in combat is to practice it. And it, it's ruthless. It's, and I think I have more PTSD from adventure racing than from combat. And it's just every day, all day long for seven to ten days pursuing the next you know thing that's in front of you. And the team dynamics are real because people will get tired and sick and injured and you get lost and you yell at each other. And what do you do with all that? And so that's how I used adventure racing to prepare me for the bigger problem of combat. Hmm. Now, I, I've never done an adventure race. The closest I've come to doing that was actually um, you might be familiar with it. It's a race called the Palmetto 200. It's a, like a 200 mile um, relay, relay team. Race. Yeah, yep, relay yep, team. Yep. Uh, I've done that a few times, and I use stories from that when it comes to leadership. I couldn't imagine the ones that I would have from, from something as significant as the adventure races that, you, that you've done. Yeah, and it's uh, I boil it down now because I have to teach it. I not have to teach it. I choose to teach those dynamics. And it boils down to uh, the team dynamic is the key. If you're going to lead people, you got to – Understanding the product is cool in your industry, but that's not where the problems are going to 
you're going to face, the problems are in how you're interacting with each other. Mm. And, you know, real leadership has a level of being able to communicate clearly, which I struggle with terribly. And uh, the second aspect is being able to uh, be accountable personally to what is going on and having other people be accountable to their place in the organization or place on the team. That is the crucible of successful leadership is, is accountability. And it certainly isn't education because there's a lot of smart people. But the, the dynamic of holding each other accountable is the critical aspect of leadership. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And that's one thing that um, – that's one of the reasons why I do this show is to hold myself accountable with the things that I'm talking about. And you know, I know I have employees that report to me that listen to this. And if I say I'm doing something, then you know what? I darn well better be doing it. That's for sure. Yep. I call that modeling when the leader does what he says he's going to do or she says she's going to do. And if she models that behavior, then it's easier for the team to take on hard challenge and challenges and account for them mm -hmm. because the leader's doing it. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. When and, and it's in that holds true for parenting as well. I know I've got three kids and you know, your kids are gonna do what they see you do, not what you tell them to do. Oh, exactly. The hardest job in the world is being a parent. I, anybody says that it's easy probably has a somebody else doing it for them <laughs> but it, it's hard there's no book to it and kids grow slowly i think it's easier to make money than it is to raise a, a child and do an adult and uh i i think it's the hardest aspect of being an adult is being a parent i i, I can't agree with you more i mean it, it's probably the most rewarding thing that i've ever done but it's also probably been the most difficult and oh it, my god it, yeah it's definitely the thing that has you know, it, it stresses me out more than anything because it's got the biggest risk. You know, I could really mess up with this. Uh, yeah. If I mess up yeah. at work, I get fired. Well, I go get another job, right? Not the end of the world. <laughs> but I can't get another kid. <laughs> People look at that in marriages too. Ah, I screwed up. I'll get divorced, find another one. <laughs> but the, you know what happens when that happens? You show up in the next relationship too, buddy. So <laughs> exactly. you got to figure you out really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing I liked about your, I really liked about your book too, is you talked about that relationship and, and some of the important things um, as far as your inner voice and the things that you say to yourself and how that, that helps with your relationships, um, you know, not just at work, but, you know, in your personal life as well. What are some of those things about um, having positive self-talk or, or, or the, the things that you say to yourself and how important is that, that uh, um, and how important is that to leadership? Gosh, you asked like two questions there. I think I asked the relationship five. <laughs> one. Yeah, so uh, – uh, the rigid, so the book Unbreakable Navy Seals Way of Life is what the publishers decided to make the title. Somehow they think the Navy, the Navy Seal thing is mm -hmm. better. But the original book I wrote for my kids has 13 lessons in them that I want that I know are critical to learn in life. And I teach them now. So I know they're very critical because I see the impact that they have. And. The title of the book was called Spartan Woman. And the reason why I put that in there is because without a strong woman, not a subservient woman, a strong woman, men flounder. And I knew because I had a previous marriage that went south and I take 50 percent responsibility to it, that without a strong woman, I, I was less of a man. And I wanted the kids to know that. And it was hard to put that in the book, not because, probably because I didn't know how to write well. But I, it was hard to, to convey that message that, you know, without a partner that is an equal, you don't accomplish that much. And I, Stacy and I rely on each other constantly to grow. And uh, that that's the first question that you sort of asked. Mm -hmm. But and the uh, what I know to be true is humans have and you ask this offline. I th the best way to describe it is to talk about it now. I know there are five aspects of life that people grow into their physical life because everybody has these five. Their intellectual life or, or their ability to learn. The third one is their ability to pursue what they value or where they make money. I call it wealth. 
the fourth one are their relationships, their key relationships, like with their family or their spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend. And the fifth one is their spiritual growth. So those five areas are where people grow in life. There aren't others. There are other factors inside of that, but those are the five areas that people grow into. And then you ask the question about internal dialogue. Your brain is a meaning-making machine. It's designed around acquiring data and making m- make it mean something. And how it makes it mean things is by processing things through what I had to give it a name called internal dialogue. It has to give language to what it experiences. And very few people get taught that. And when they get taught it, man, can you see things happen? So how you process things using language is critical to understand. Like things are good or bad. If you say something's bad, you have a a way to interact with it that is bad. And if you say something's good, then you interact with it differently. Like people look outside and it's raining and they're like, ah, the day is over. Somebody who can process internal dialogue well, you know, like say I wanted to go out and run 10 miles, they go, okay, I got to put on a rain jacket. If you can't process it that way, the environment will take you for a ride. But if you know how important language is, you can overcome pretty much everything. And I, I know it to be true. And after training 85 executives in the past five years, I, I can see it now that it's actually learnable and watch their life grow really quickly in those five areas by processing things differently. Hmm. Yeah, I think <clears throat> even, even in the geek sector. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, even us IT nerds can learn a little bit, huh? <laughs> well, you know, because humans are there. Mm-hmm. As long as humans are there, there's a great possibility for growth. If it's just computers on computers, they'll do only what they've been programmed to do. Even in the AI world, it has a limit to itself because humans are the biggest change makers. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And um, I've seen it in my own life. Just, you know, um, you, you talked about, you know, you, you weren't necessarily a writer. You just wrote this stuff down. Um, but one of the things I had to tell myself before I wrote um, my first book was that I kept saying, I'm not an author. I'm not an author. I can't do this. But no one's an author until they've written their first book. You have to do it first before, you know, no one's ran a marathon until they've actually ran a marathon. They're not a marathoner until they, they run the marathon. I disagree. Oh, yeah? You're actually, you're actually the person uh, because outcome doesn't determine success. Uh, like if you think uh, you have to be a three-hour marathon runner to be successful, you may never say that you're a successful marathoner. However, you are. You just didn't hit that goal because, you know, in running a marathon, there's <laughs> six months of actually running to train to get there. That's part of being a marathoner is the prep. Yeah, and, I'll, I'll agree with that. Um, and, you, know, you know, what does it take? What is what is your distinction being successful in I.T.? If it's a point in space, you may never get there. But look at what all the stuff that happens between here and there that is who you are on a daily basis. And you asked, you know, the, the, the language itself has a beautiful structure to it and you actually used it. I am a marathon runner. If you can say that, mm-hmm. then you will do it. Most people can't say it. I'm not, ask somebody, I'm not a runner. You're right. You're not. Ask the ones who run what, you know, who they are. They're like, yeah, I'm a runner. Sometimes it sucks. Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes I don't do what I'm supposed to do, but I run because I am marathon runner has to find a way to find itself. And if you say I'm not something that too has to find a way to find I'm not that person. And that's a a 10 hour conversation boiled down into about three minutes. (laughs) Yeah, I guess what I was getting at is that, you know, you can't say that you're not something if you haven't tried it yet. 
if you haven't succeeded or, you know, you don't have to, you're right. You don't have to complete the marathon to be a marathon runner. You have, but you have to start training for it. Yeah. You have to say, I'm a marathon runner. And then you got to sign up for the dang thing and put money down because without risk, humans don't do anything or without commitment. And then you got to process it and then you got to do it. But mo- I, I, you know, I, I, I agree and disagree with what you say because most people actually say they're not things very quickly. Mm-hmm. There's no way I can, you know, be successful or I'm not successful because they let the environment dictate dictate that to them. Yeah, no, I'm not going to be a good husband because I failed at it a hundred times, or I, I, I can't, you know, do this coding application because it's just I just can't do it. So they start out with not too much. And not will solve itself by guaranteeing that you won't do it. But people who use language effectively always lead with, I am going to solve this, and I don't care what happens. Mm-hmm. And that distinctive change is the key. Don't say I'm not. Just stop it. Say I am. It's the greatest way to start most people think it's silly, but you can hear it in people's language. Yeah, and that's think, the key. You said that in your book, or, or maybe it was on your podcast. You talked about the difference between saying hope and believe, um, where where you don't say. I think that that's I, one. Of the, that's one of the lessons, and most people struggle with that, just because society and social media use it inappropriately. And uh, hope the the distinction of hope has no action to it. Every time people use the word hope, it's because they're not doing anything to solve a problem. Like, I hope somebody comes to pick me up. Okay. (laughs) What are you doing about it? Gosh, I hope it doesn't rain. I don't know that you can do anything about that. Hope is the absence of action. Hmm. Belief is the absence of knowledge. People believe in things they have no knowledge of. If you have knowledge of something, you wouldn't use belief in a sentence. Like, you know, the, the, the conversation is, I, you know, I believe in God. Well, if you had an experience of God, you can't use it that way. You just say, yeah, I know, I know that. I know that aspect of it because I've had experience. Like you're a marathon runner or you at least run one. Mm-hmm. You don't use belief in any structure around marathoning. Like, I believe I'll do well. You're like, I know it's going to suck at about mile 25 or 24. You know, 20 for me (laughs) or 20 or 16 for me. You know, but yeah, but you you can't use belief in that sentence because it doesn't fit. You can believe in yourself, which is a, a, a cop out, but you know because you've had experience what can happen and then you train against it but if you use belief you will never seek an answer so those are two very crippling languages that I uh, train people to avoid at all costs yeah I think that's really good advice and and once I heard you say that I write that I was like oh you know that makes so much sense that not to use those words because I've always grown up that you know hope and belief are like positive words those are good things but they're actually like detrimental to you actually succeeding yeah they're they're not action oriented they're feeling oriented but they're not action oriented Mm -hmm. and the human condition needs to like you know if I you know I I hope this program writes itself (laughs) nobody's going to write it now exactly and, you know, I believe that, you know, this deal is going to we're going to do well on the deal. You won't find a solution if you sit there in that belief state. It's just a normal course of human you know, experiences that those two words create no momentum at all. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And that's one thing that a lot of new leaders, they fall into, um, I think, the trap of of being nervous and not knowing exactly what to do and then just hoping for the best. Yeah. Hoping for the best, the greatest strategy in the world <laughs> <laughs> that never works it has, out. It has no value to it whatsoever. 
Yeah. So what, what is some advice that you have for uh, new leaders, some things that you may have learned over the years um, leading through difficult situations that will help help someone out uh, when, they, when they're new to the environment? They don't have any you know, reputation to bring with them. They don't have any, um, any, anything other than themselves. I, I think there's three bits of wisdom that I've learned and been taught. And the first critical aspect of being a good leader is being hungry. You have to be hungry to go to work. You have to be hungry to go get new business. So hunger or the ability to hunt and the desire to to hunt is the critical factor. You have to lean. You have to be leaning into the the target, so to speak, as a leader. Uh, The second one is you have to have the skill. So if you're asking other people to do something, you better keep your skill set high. And you know, I, I call that skill orientation. So hunger and skill orientation. Always be honing your skill, even if you're in charge. Because people follow other people who are good at something, even if that other person's better. But they like to see the person that is in charge doing the stuff. And that's a critical leadership aspect. And the fourth one or the third one is uh, the word is actually humble. It's not I, I, I have a different language for it. So it's the ability to fail and then start over and say, I, I screwed that up. Dang it. OK, let's start over tomorrow. So those factors of hunger, humble, and having a high skill set are the keys to leading. And if you're not doing those three, it makes your at your ability to lead dwindle very quickly over time. I think those are really good. And a lot of people um, have trouble with those, especially in the technology f- stage. Um, I know like with me – I was a good developer. I was a coder. I like to be in front of the computer. I didn't have the people skills necessarily <laughs> that I should have had. And then they, like the next step up is, oh, you become the manager of those people. And there was really not a whole lot of hunger to, to lead people. It was to get the, the, the job done. And um, it was well, almost – still hung. Yeah, yeah, it is. You're right. But, but it wasn't for, for the right reasons, I don't believe, mm-hmm. for me. Mm-hmm. It was more for let me write the code. I want to write the code. Um, not, I want to see the t- team succeed. And I had to learn so that's that. The, that's the third aspect that you, you're struggling with, mm-hmm. the humble. The humble. So you notice that there's a problem. Realizing that the problem is always you is the key to leadership. The problem is always you, how you look at it. If you don't know something, learn it. If you're bad at something, overcome it. Or have somebody else overcome it, but at least recognizing that you're the the funnel of the problem. That's and a lot ex- of people don't like to know that reality. That's exactly what my mentor told me uh, several years ago when I was when I was new to leadership. I, I, after um, I had two people quit the same day, mm-hmm. and I went and talked to him to talk about you know, and I was complaining about you know, well, you know, we're close to Charlotte's got the banks; they're paying people more. That's why people are leaving. And, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do about this. And he just stops and looked at me. He's like, do you really think it's the banks, that, the reason why they're leaving? I said, well, yeah, what else would it be? He's like, well, I'm pretty mm-hmm. sure it's you. <laughs> and uh, it was kind of that light bulb moment like, oh, crap. Um, and I need to learn about this leadership thing. And uh, yep. and then one thing that I've, I've also noticed with, with a lot of technical people um, in the software development stage is when they become managers and they're pulled away from the code a little bit, they don't keep their skills as sharp as they need to. And yep. you need to, like, exactly like you said, you have to keep those skill levels high. And, um, I, you know, I'll take on projects every now and then just to keep my skill set up. And one of the other things that I do is I teach part time at, um, at Winthrop University to keep that skill set high. To, so I'm aware of the new things that are coming in. Because, yeah, teaching is a double edged sword because you thought you were really good until you start teaching it and you're like, wow. I'm not as good as I thought I was at the thing that I'm teaching. So it, it demands that you keep uh, a skill set high. And I th- the learning is always uh, like a 4X factor when you teach it because you learn four times more than when you're being taught something. By teaching it, you learn a lot more. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. There's there's so many times where I thought, oh, I'll just teach this class. And then when I got into it, I realized how little I knew because I didn't know how to explain it in a way that someone that was unexperienced could understand it. Yep. And it was, the it was, coding world is a, a fun world that's filled with people and emotions and technology. <laughs> <laughs> and those three don't like to mix. If you put them in a bowl, they don't want to mix very well. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Yep, you're absolutely right. Um, so, what are some tips or, or that you have for people to um, to help them try to stay humble um, when they are seeing success? Oh, wow! What a good question. Uh, the, the one of the aspects of being humble is uh, being, like you said before, being okay with being comfort or, or un- uncomfortable or uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable. When you start that, that creates being humble because it's just a, a, a derivative of being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And the other one is you have to be willing to change on a dime. If something's not working, it's you and you have to change quickly. And don't blame other people. It's you. It's how you're filtering the, the problem. So those two elements of being humble, and it, I would have answered the question differently had there had been asked. So one of the, the the greatest thing about leadership or about growth, I, they're actually the same, is you have to focus on yourself quite often. You have to be healthy. You have to keep learning. You have to be hungry. You have to take care of your relationships at home and you have to have a spiritual pursuit that you can deal with. Those five areas are the key points to being a leader. And humble is a trait of that. And leaders, if they don't pursue all five, falter within one to two years. Because you can make a lot of money and if you don't have health, half of it goes away. You can make a lot of money, and if you don't keep your relationships alive, your wife or husband gets half when they leave. (laughs) And if you don't keep learning, you will get stale, and the competition will blow right by you as if you didn't even know they were there. And the spirituality aspect of it is got to be able to connect dots that most people cannot because everything is interconnected. Hmm. And your ability to see that as a leader or as any human being creates momentum and growth and you become very valuable when you can connect dots yeah i think you're absolutely right that's and and those five things when i when i first saw that you had those um and and i was kind of reading through them and and saw you know physical wealth spiritual relationship and intellectual that that just makes you a better person in general and you can apply that to leadership you can apply that to to many different areas once you're taking care of yourself imagine so if you're a leader and you look at those five areas That's how you see other people. Then it's easy to interact with them because they're struggling in those five areas. That allows you to communicate, like what's going on at home. I see what's going on at work. Kind of, you're having a rough time. Tell me what's going on, because you're dwelling with your own stuff as well. So it's it's easier when you look internally to deal externally, because the fault is always yours. (laughs) So. Look at you first, and you look at them second. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You got to take care of yourself first, and then second. And that's one of the things that I actually did a podcast about that uh, not too long ago about putting your oxygen mask on first. It's, it's you know that's what they always tell you on every flight. You know, if you have young kids, you put take care of yourself first. Um, otherwise, you won't be there to help them. Yep. Um, so you <laughs> mentioned Spartan first, but it's oh. not. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, um, in your book, you mentioned Spartan uh, Woman was going to be the title. And you talk a lot about having a, a good woman um, kind of behind the scenes for, for men to be successful. And that's one thing um, I, I've realized ha- having you know a, a wonderful wife. Hopefully she's listening to this. <laughs> but um, how is it that um, as men in, in business and in, uh, in, in leadership, how is it that we can um, help relate to uh, women that are also powerful leaders? Demand that they be powerful. Mm. Don't demand subservience. It will kill you as a man if around you are less in your eyes. 
demand require that they grow in their life. And the second one is never let your wife or husband compromise themselves for you. That is hard. That they actually teach them compromise. I don't believe in compromise. I think it's terrible. Uh, and tend to compromise themselves. And they don't need to. I think that's those really- two areas. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Um, and, and I've seen that happen a lot of times where people will compromise themselves and then get resentful. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> then you have a wife or husband at home, and then stay tuned, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so what pieces of advice would you have for um, for someone who, let, let's say you're – um, you've been a leader for a while and you're moving to a new team and you have to build, kind of build that new rapport up that, that you didn't have before. How would you come into a situation like that? Uh, I think uh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't look at it like there's ever an old team. Mm. I, I'm, a believe, I'm a big fan of disruption. Like every 90 days, you better disrupt what you're doing. Because you get complacent, you get tired, lethargic, coders get into a groove and they want to be left alone. But it's not good for human beings to get into a groove for a long period of time. So a lot of disruptive efforts, even if you don't change teams or don't become a leader of a new group. So if you're always disrupting things to the advantage of everybody, not the disadvantage. So you, you, you throw something and that breaks it to see what everybody's weak points are. And people, if they allow that to happen, there's always upward growth. So if you take on a new team and you're always a disruptive person for growth, not just create angst, then every time you take on a new team, it's just a new adventure for you. And because here's the thing in any business, disruption wins. Stagnation doesn't. And that's what happens to businesses. They get stagnant, and then they look for help on the outside through venture capital or through private equity firms. Private equity firms are going to come in, and they're going to disrupt everything. They're going to get rid of all the flesh that has no value, and that's very disruptive. And then they win at the end after the disruption. How how a private equity firm can put a a new leader in charge who's disruptive and then 10 X the company. It's because the, the disruption causes everything to work and people are scared of disruption. They're scared of it. Yeah. The great leaders are disruptors by nature. Yeah, I definitely see that people are afraid of of disruption, and I've seen it so many times in the past. There's so many business examples of how companies that failed to innovate or failed to change, um, and Kodak's one one great example how they had the technology for digital cameras, but they were afraid that that would you know d- disrupt their um, you know film cells, yeah. so they didn't release it, and someone else beat and them to the, the punch. That passed them passed them so quickly. What was it like in a year? They were gone. Yeah, exactly. They're still there, but they they were gone. Yeah, they went from being the leader of film and cameras to yep. uh, we're no longer relevant. Yep. Yeah, crazy. It's pretty much overnight because they don't want disruption, and people get stale because the people. Yeah, and that's the key. If you can ever understand the positive aspect of disruption, and you 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 saw it when you were marathoning, so. Disruptive effort in running is you start out running five miles a week for two weeks, whatever. And then you have to disrupt that model. You have to run 10 miles. It's disruption. It causes pain, but it increases success. And that's a key. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you just ran five miles a day for five days in a row, and then you did that thinking that you were going to be prepared for the marathon, it probably hit you at mile 15 go, oh, my. I'm not ready for this. Yep. But yeah. disruption, it's just you got to embrace it. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. If you don't, you're going to be left behind. And that's the only way to improve is to change. And and that's yep. you know a very simple concept, but uh, sometimes it's hard for people to um, to welcome that change. Yep. Um, well, Tom, I really appreciate having you on. What what, um, what are some ways that people can connect with you or learn more about some of your services and some of the things that you're doing these days? Well, uh, the easiest way to see what we do is our, we have a website at T-H-O-M-S-H-E-A dot com. And we're on Facebook under the same name. And uh, also we have a page on Facebook called Unbreakable. And I have a podcast each week called Unbreakable Podcast. And we have an online training for people that really want to learn a lot about themselves called The 13 Unbreakable Lessons or at unbreakablelessons.com. And uh, we are very responsive because we know the value of being responsive to people is that it creates momentum. I hope you guys enjoyed this interview with Tom Shea, and please hit him up on Twitter. If you go to geekleader.com slash Tom Shea, T-H-O-M-S-H-E-A, you will get a link to um, the show notes. It will also include links to uh, Tom's work and his podcast. He has a great podcast that uh, I've been consuming a lot lately, and it's just um, wonderful life lessons to help you out and to benefit those um, that want to make their life better and want to want to be a better person. Um, they're just fantastic. So please check those out. And if you've enjoyed this episode or any of the other episodes, please make sure you subscribe and leave a rating and review in iTunes or uh, wherever you listen to your podcast. That would be awesome. Thanks so much.